Welcome to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. We hope you enjoy part two of our Connecticut Witch Trials 101 series. This week, we'll discuss witchcraft beliefs in New England, give an overview of the founding of Connecticut and the founding of the town of Windsor, before we move on to the trial and execution of Alice Young, who is believed to be the first person hanged for witchcraft in New England. In this episode, we'll dispel some common misconceptions. First of all, every person executed for witchcraft in New England was hanged, not burned. Nobody was burned for witchcraft here, but they were at other places in Europe. Do people assume it because of the media they've seen? Do people just equate burning and witches? It would seem to have been influenced by transatlantic communication and immigrants with memories of the burning times in their countries. Do people visualize burning a witch as destroying a witch versus an execution? I feel like if you're thinking about witches being burned, then you're also thinking more of the murderous mob style. That's another part of the lore. I think the more people recognize New England was hanging, then they're thinking about, oh, it's an execution. There was a trial. What was that trial like? We are really excited for you to hear this episode. We sure are. Before we introduce Alice Young, we'd like to set the stage for you by providing a little background on witchcraft belief in early New England and the settling of Connecticut. In evaluating witchcraft belief in early modern New England, it is important to note that ministers and the educated elite held different views than most of the public. Many beliefs overlap, but those who claim to be victimized by witchcraft focused on human agency in magical practice, while the clergy largely focused on Satan as the source of the witch's power. In popular belief, a witch was a person who used magic for sinister purposes. A witch was a person who was believed to have the skill to manipulate occult forces in order to perform maleficium, which is the act of causing harm supernaturally. Women were believed to be more sinful and more evil than men and more vulnerable to becoming witches. The reasoning included the belief that women's bodies weren't as strong as men's and therefore the devil could more readily access women's souls. Of the 49 people known to have been accused of witchcraft in Connecticut between 1647 and 1742, 36 were women, 11 were men, and two were unidentified. Further, seven of the men accused were married to women who were accused first. Only four of the 49 were men who were not married to female witchcraft suspects. Four. That's a small number. Witches were said to have teats, where imps or animal familiars suckled. These were often hidden in their secret parts. The witch was the embodiment of the corrupted woman. Rather than celebrate and encourage fertility, she actively worked against it. Rather than be the perfect helpmate to her husband, she chose to be a handmaiden to the devil himself. The witch attempted to invert the power structure, diverting authority from man to woman. She was not a housewife. She was a force of her own. Maleficium most commonly involved employing magic to injure, sicken, or kill a person or a domestic animal. However, targets of Maleficium also included ships, homes, and crops. Image magic involved the use of the likeness of a person to injure them. Poppets were commonly believed to be used for this purpose and could be made of common materials like cloth, rags, wax, or birch bark. These images would then be harmed by hand, needle, water, or fire. To recruit people, Satan and his devils often first appeared to targets in the guise of animals. Outside of Salem, most witch trial witnesses did not mention the devil. However, as shown in those Salem cases and a handful of others, people believed that witches covenanted with him directly and signed his book in blood. And signed his book, sometimes in blood, sometimes in ink, sometimes in just, they would say it was red, like blood. Sometimes they would say they actually cut their finger and signed it with their own blood. They actually put that detail in some of the Salem testimony. And his book was always changing color, shape, size, and material. If you pay attention to those testimonies, they're always inconsistent. Sometimes his 
book was a piece of like just a sheet of birch bark that people had etched their names into. These women in the devil's book, you know, they're putting their name in it. And of course, the counterpart, the book of life, which you don't put your own name in, your name's put into it. I just think it's interesting that they are fantasizing that these women are signing their name into a book for the devil. Because I was like, what is the significance of him having names in a book? It's an inversion of the covenant, basically, and inversion of God's grace. You don't put your own name in the book of life, but you do put it in the devil's book. It's all about rebellion. Mid to late Middle Ages, they just were focused on witchcraft as an act of rebellion against God. And then they got into the Satan's pact thing. Witches often gathered in groups, as seen in the Hartford Witch Panic and the Salem Witch Hunt. How many people were meeting with Reverend Burroughs at the Witch Sabbath described in the Salem Witch Trials? Dozens. It was a huge amount. They might have had hundreds at some of their things. There was definitely dozens, and they were coming from Connecticut. In Salem, they definitely were intimately aware of what had happened in Connecticut. And they were saying that witches were coming from Connecticut to Salem Village. At Hartford, the supposed witch meeting may have been a harmless Christmas celebration, which was interpreted as a witch's Sabbath. During the Salem witch hunt, these Sabbaths were recounted in vivid detail by the afflicted persons and the confessors. In the early modern mind, two worlds coexisted on earth, the visible world and the invisible world. The boundaries between these worlds were porous, and creatures from the invisible world often visited the visible world. Likewise, people learned in magic could tap into powers from the invisible world to manipulate the visible. As Dr. Kathy Hermes explained, New England was viewed as the battleground between God and Satan, where the English attempted to establish Christ's church, and the devil attempted to pull it down. While witchcraft was reviled, not all magic was frowned upon by the people at large. Acceptable occult practices included protective magic, counter magic, and healing magic. New Englanders commonly hid objects and symbols in their homes to ward off witches and evil spirits. As Dr. Emerson Baker explained in episode 25, garlands and wreaths were hung on doors and windows as barriers to evil. Not just decor. Horseshoes and other iron objects were also nailed over doorways or secreted in walls to prevent spirits from entering. Symbols were etched near entries and exits to catch demons. Chimneys and wells were protected in such fashion because evil spirits frequently used those openings to gain access to homes. Counter magic involved various methods of detecting and harming witches. Bewitched objects and the hair, nails, and urine of bewitched persons were burned to destroy the evil magic or transfer it back to the witch. When animals were believed to be victims of maleficium, body parts like ears and tails were burned. Ouch. Poor animals. Healing magic was a dangerous line of work. Those with the power to heal were believed to also have the power to harm. Contrary to popular belief, midwives were seldom targets of witchcraft accusations. However, there are recorded instances of women who provided healing services being accused. Other magical enterprises also put people at risk of accusation. Methods of divination are reported in several cases, and a few of those tried for witchcraft openly engaged in fortune-telling. The fortune-telling they were doing wasn't communing with spirits. It was palmistry, reading people. Marilyn told us Samuel Wardwell would look at somebody's hand and then tell their fortune, and other people were, like, turning the sieve and scissors or doing the Bible and key thing to tell fortunes. There were these different divination methods, and the Venus glass, 
stuff like that were all divination, but there was an action involved and you're interpreting the results. The fortune telling that's getting messages from the other side is through mediums, which are a more recent invention that came out of the spiritualist movement of the 19th century. They had those kinds of visions, but that wasn't them accusing the witches of doing that. That was the afflicted people saying, I have spectral vision and these specters of deceased people appeared to me. It was the the witch people who were the mediums, if you think about it. While ministers and the educated elite believed in witches as much as the average layperson, the clergy emphasized the diabolical pact they believed was the source of the witch's power. For clergymen, all magic came from the devil. Counter magic was a form of going to the devil for help against the devil. However, the clergy accepted, or at least turned a blind eye to, certain occult practices performed by the educated elite, including alchemy and astrology. Witchcraft became a capital crime in England in 1542, and an enhanced witchcraft act was passed in 1604, which made it a felony to compact with the devil or have familiarity with evil spirits. And now Minute with Mary. Mary Bingham has more details on the standards of evidence for witchcraft trials. The earliest laws and orders of the General Court of Connecticut, the Code of 1650, and the Book of General Laws and Liberties concerning the inhabitants of Massachusetts both state the following. Anyone convicted of witchcraft will be put to death. In criminal cases, the court was to rely on the testimony of two eyewitnesses against the person who was accused. However, this was not always done in the cases of witchcraft, particularly in the colony of Connecticut. That is, until the case against Catherine Harrison of Wethersfield in 1669. Catherine was accused, tried, she was held in jail, and she awaited a new trial. Governor John Winthrop Jr. had Catherine released from jail and placed her under house arrest. Angry residents petitioned the court, ordering her immediate return to prison. Instead, Governor Winthrop and the magistrates drafted a letter to Gershom Bulkley and other area ministers for advisement. Gershom, on behalf of the ministers, advised that spectral evidence was enough to indict but not enough to convict a person. Furthermore, because the ministers believed that the devil could disguise himself as an innocent person, afflict harm to others and their environment, the two-person testimony was now to be strictly enforced going forward. Two people would need to testify to the same event at the same time in the same place. Had this rule been enforced in the witchcraft cases between 1647 through 1663, the following people may not have been hanged. Alice Young, Mary Johnson, John Carrington, Joan Carrington, Goodwife Bassett, Goodwife Knapp, Lydia Gilbert, Mary Sanford, Rebecca Greensmith, Nathaniel Greensmith, and Mary Barnes. Thank you, Mary. Many factors contributed to witchcraft accusations. Economics. Psychology. Fear of warfare. Religious beliefs. Gender roles. Authorities interested in suppressing deviant behavior. And most importantly, the social history, which is revealed in the records. A history of neighborly quarrels was at the heart of many cases. The English Civil War produced the witch finders Matthew Hopkins and John Stearns. They stepped in to fill a power vacuum when the central authority lost power over individual towns and districts. The local authorities were all too happy to step in and govern themselves. And Matthew Hopkins, the self-appointed witch finder general, and his assistant John Stearns went through the countryside in East Anglia, exploiting that power vacuum by going from town to town 
to hunt witches and get paid by the town per witch that they found. And Matthew Hopkins and John Stearns developed witch-finding techniques, which at the least pushed the limits of the law in England against torture. By employing techniques such as watching and walking, which kept people awake for sometimes days on end in order to pressure them and put on psychological torture as well as physical deprivation to get confessions. Hopkins and Stearns both wrote books about their witch-finding methods and cases, and those books made it over from England to New England, which we know because they were cited in one of the early cases where the officials said they were employing the witch-finding techniques coming out of England, referencing the Matthew Hopkins techniques. Specifically, the officials in New England were watching, which is keeping an observation on a person you're keeping awake. You've got people rotating in around the clock, keeping this person from falling asleep in order to watch 24 hours a day to see if imps or familiars come to suckle the witch's teats. So that's what they have. They have these peeping toms, these little pervos sitting there keeping a woman on a three-legged stool or something all day and night, just watching for imps and familiars to come and give suck. And in some cases, the watchers claim to actually see this. Sometimes they reference things like bugs that came into the room or mice that came into the room. But they assume that those are familiars because they're in witch-finding mode and they find witches. And so some of these methods were actually used in New England, and therefore Hopkins' witch hunt was influential. And you look at the timing of when Hopkins was active in the mid-1640s and the timing of the first witchcraft case in New England, which was 1647, the trial of Alice Young. Timing-wise, you can see the transmission of this information from England. All these books are being written about the various English witch trials, and they're coming over to America. And letters, people coming over are spreading the word. Oh, there's all these witch trials going on in England. And so New England thinks it's happening there. It's probably happening here, because we are God's chosen ones. As we know from talking to Mary W. Craig about Scotland, the holier you are, the more the devil's going to attack you. And that's a theory at the time that was also prevalent in England and New England. That's why New Englanders thought they were in the battleground between God and Satan. That's where Satan's going to be the most active and he's going to employ the most witches because they were establishing a new pure. Christian Church. And now we'd like to talk to you about the settling of Connecticut. Following the establishment of the colony of Massachusetts Bay, multiple nations and colonies vied for control of what is now the state of Connecticut, though indigenous peoples already held that area. The Dutch were the first Europeans to claim land in Connecticut when they established a trading post known as the House of Good Hope in what is now Hartford in 1633. However, that same year, a group of English from the Plymouth colony followed and established a trading post of their own in the area which is now Windsor. It's a value to remember that through this claiming and establishing, there was conflict happening. Attacks. They were attacking each other. In the early 1630s, some of the Native American leaders went to John Winthrop in Massachusetts to try to get him to come and help them fight the Pequot nation. And John Winthrop wasn't interested at the time in doing that, but they went to Edward Winslow in Plymouth and he was interested. So he sent this guy the military leader, Matthew Holmes, over to form the trading post. And I think that's of value to know that there's all this conflict going on. And this is the background of which trials are suddenly happening in the 1640s. But there's always this conflict and tension there. And 
threats and actual combat. In 1635, settlers from Dorchester in the Massachusetts Bay migrated to the vicinity of the Plymouth Trading Post. Around the same time, a group of English migrants came to the same spot, armed with a document called the Warwick Patent, which does not exist today. The document was reportedly issued by the Earl of Warwick in 1631 and entitled the Patentees to a 120-mile band of land stretching all the way from the western border of Rhode Island to the Pacific Ocean. Which is why Connecticut had land in Ohio Territory given as a western reserve. It was based off the Warwick patent after America had become an independent nation and Connecticut was a state, and the nation's expanding to the West, they're still like, but the Warwick patent. And so they actually gave them this chunk of Ohio. Today, we only have John Withrop Jr.'s 1662 copy of the patent, which he used in negotiating a charter for Connecticut from King Charles II. The community these groups established was initially called Dorchester, but soon renamed Windsor. Nearly simultaneously to the development of Windsor, communities were established in Wethersfield, Saybrook, and Hartford. In 1636, the settlements of Hartford, Windsor, and Wethersfield came together to form the colony of Connecticut. Saybrook retained its independence as a separate colony. In 1637, a devastating war was waged by the English colonists against the Pequot nation. The following year, more English colonists arrived, creating the New Haven Colony. In 1639, Connecticut Colony adopted the Fundamental Orders, which framed its government. In 1642, Connecticut banned witchcraft. This law was based upon the laws of England and Massachusetts Bay, as well as biblical injunctions in Exodus 22.18, Leviticus 20.27, and Deuteronomy 18.10-11. Exodus 22.18 Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Leviticus 20.27 A man also, or woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy 18.10-11 There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. The Massachusetts Body of Liberties of 1641 stated, If any man or woman be a witch, that is, hath or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. In 1644, Connecticut and Saybrook united. In 1646, John Winthrop Jr. founded the Pequot Colony, which was later renamed New London intending it to be a center of alchemical study. In 1650, Connecticut codified its laws. The code was written by Roger Ludlow, the colony's only lawyer and possible author of the Fundamental Orders, who was later sued for defamation by Thomas Staples, a husband of Mary Staples. In the Staples suit, it came out that Ludlow had pressured Giddy Knapp to confess. As a result of the defamation action, Ludlow was ordered to pay the Staples 15 pounds for calling Mary a witch. In 1662, John Winthrop Jr. received a charter from King Charles II, which unified the New Haven and Connecticut colonies and set the boundaries of Connecticut to include everything from the Narragansett Bay in the east-west to the Pacific Ocean. North-south, the colony ran from the border with Massachusetts down to the Atlantic coast and included most of Long Island. However, Connecticut lost some of its territory in 1664 when the Duke of York was granted a patent, including what is now the state of New York. A 1664 agreement between John Winthrop Jr. and Governor Roger Williams of Rhode Island gave the latter colony control of all lands west of the Narragansett Bay and east of the Pocatuck River. Additionally, the boundary with Massachusetts had been surveyed incorrectly in 1642 and was set seven to eight miles south of its proper place. Now that we've covered the background, let's get to the story of the first victim, Alice Young. Nothing is firmly known about Alice Young's life before her hanging. 
The first evidence of any Youngs in Connecticut are records showing that John Young had purchased land in Windsor by 1640. We know John was Alice's husband because Thomas Thornton wrote to John Winthrop Jr. about John Young's illness, and Winthrop wrote on the back of the letter that his wife was hanged for a witch at Connecticut. John Young was a carpenter who lived in the Backer Row section of Windsor, next door to the Thorntons. John and Alice had one known child. A daughter also named Alice. Not much is known of the Young's lives in Windsor, but we can give you some background on what Alice's life may have been like as a Puritan wife and mother. Married women of non-elite status were known by the title Good Wife. A woman was a man's helpmate. Her daily work involved caring for children, tending livestock, gardening, brewing, making clothes, cooking, cleaning, washing, and having babies. As deputy husbands, women sometimes also shared in their husbands' work duties. We know some things about Alice Young's neighbors on Backer Row. Thomas Thornton was a tanner. He married Ann Tinker in London in 1633. They lived among Ann's siblings as several Tinker families settled in Windsor most living on Backer Row. John Young purchased his land from William Hubbard, husband of Anne's sister, Ellen Tinker. Thomas and Anne Thornton had six children at the time of Alice Young's trial. Priscilla, Thomas, Anne, Samuel, Mary, and Timothy. An epidemic, perhaps influenza, ravaged the Connecticut River Valley in 1647, beginning in the spring. Thomas Thornton lost four children to the epidemic, Priscilla, Thomas, Anne, and Samuel. Priscilla died bravely, and her story was later preserved for posterity by Cotton Mather. Historians theorize that Alice Young was blamed for starting the epidemic through witchcraft. There are no records of Alice Young's trial, but a typical New England witch trial involved the following phases. One, misfortune. Number two, identification of the culprit. A complaint filed with the magistrates. A warrant for apprehension. The arrest of the suspect. And the examination, with questions from the magistrate, intense physical examination by a jury of women. And possibly a swim test to see if the suspect sank or floated. Sinking was a sign of innocence, while floating suggested guilt. Following the examination, the suspect was usually jailed unless the magistrates thought there wasn't evidence to proceed with an investigation. Testimonies were gathered. An indictment was written. The grand jury reviewed the indictment. If they returned the verdict ignoramus, there is insufficient evidence and the suspect is released. If they return the indictment, Bella Vera, true bill, they find there is enough evidence for trial. Then the petty jury heard the evidence. They hear the evidence and deliver the verdict. If acquitted, the suspect is released only after paying jail fees. And we know of instances where some people perished, unable to pay those jail fees. Due to the terribly unsanitary conditions in the jails. If convicted, the sentence is announced. Following a guilty verdict, the justices either issue a death warrant or appeal to a higher court for a ruling on the case. If there was no appeal or the appeal is rejected, the suspect is led from the jail to the place designated for hanging. In Connecticut's case, we do not know the site of the Hartford witchcraft executions. The bound prisoner is then carried up a ladder by the executioner who places the rope about the neck and pushes the convict off the ladder. The prisoner, hung from either a tree or a gallows, chokes out slowly. This could take 10 minutes or more, but usually the convict passed out and didn't have to experience the agony of a slow, ignoble death. The whereabouts of the bodies of those hanged for witchcraft are unknown. Why is that? The bodies of witches as rebels against God could not be placed among the elect, the saints, in a church cemetery. No respect whatsoever was afforded a witch. And some of them were excommunicated from the church before their execution. 
The first execution took place somewhere in Hartford. We don't know where. The old meeting house was located where the old state house stands today. The hangings may have taken place on Meeting House Green or at another location in Hartford. We do not know where Alice's body was laid to rest. Tradition tells us some of the Salem victims were secretly retrieved and buried by family. However, we do not have even this much to go on regarding Connecticut's with Charles victims. After the hanging, the residents of Backer Row dispersed to other communities in Connecticut and Massachusetts. John Young survived the epidemic and relocated to Stratford, where he acquired land in 1652. He suffered from an illness which impacted his skin and also caused John to lose hair and nails. John Young died in April 1661, and nobody ever claimed his property. The first record of Alice Young Jr. after her mother's hanging was for her marriage to Simon Beeman in Windsor in 1654. Interestingly, Simon Beeman had testified against two people accused of witchcraft in Springfield, Mary Lewis Parsons and her husband, Hugh Parsons. Alice Young Beeman and Simon Beeman resided in Springfield, Massachusetts. They raised a sizable family there. In 1677, Thomas Beeman, son of Alice Young Beeman and Simon Beeman, sued a man for defaming him and his mother. The man allegedly said his mother was a witch, and he looked like one. There's a lot of speculation about who Alice Young may have been, and where she may have been born, and where she may have married John, whether she was a healer. None of this has been confirmed. Alice, like the rest of Connecticut's witch trial victims, has not been exonerated, and still remains Guilty as charged on the books. Now here's Sarah with End Witch Hunt's News. End Witch Hunt News. Thou Shalt Not Suffer podcast is a project of End Witch Hunt's movement. End Witch Hunt's is a nonprofit organization working to educate you about witch trial history and working to motivate you to advocate for modern alleged witches. You will not find our message sensational or amusing, confusing or muddied. Today, I want you to think about the phrase additional efforts. Remember when the Connecticut witch trial history was minimized and overlooked, not widely known as a significant part of witch hunt history? Bringing Connecticut to the forefront of witch trial conversation took additional efforts, efforts by dozens of individuals over several decades. But in the most recent years, the culmination of those efforts created a new wave of results, and now Connecticut witch trial victims are known. Now we must all work with additional efforts to include the modern witch hunt horror and witchcraft misconceptions in the everyday witchcraft conversations. Only additional efforts will integrate the modern witch hunt crisis and witch phobia into social justice action. The communities clutched by this behavior need to be acknowledged and supported. The United Nations Council for Human Rights is sending the message that we must all begin to address what is happening by making additional efforts. This last month, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights reported the severity of human rights violations and abuses rooted in harmful practices related to accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks cause adverse human rights impacts on persons in vulnerable situations and the factors that affect their vulnerability. They have concluded that additional efforts, including more comprehensive data gathering and further research, are needed to develop a greater understanding of the various aspects of this complex problem. It recommends a number of actions, such as developing comprehensive frameworks for prevention. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights recommends that states undertake action. South Africa, a nation that has been working toward the elimination of witchcraft attacks with overall success, is still working to completely eliminate attacks and stop pagan discrimination. Damon Leff, friend of the podcast from episode 14, has dedicated his professional and personal efforts to legal reform action to stop all witchcraft discrimination. He has recently published a response to the Pan-African Parliament's own Guidelines on Accusations of Witchcraft and Ritual Attacks Towards Eliminating Harmful Practices and Other Human Rights Violations. He writes, In July 2021, the United Nations Human Rights Council Draft Resolution 47, titled Elimination of Harmful Practices Related to Accusations of Witchcraft and Ritual Attacks, called on member states to condemn harmful practices related to accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks that result in human rights violations to ensure effective protection of all persons in vulnerable situations likely to be subjected to accusations of witchcraft, 
in which will tax and to promote bilateral, regional, and international initiatives. In collaboration with relevant regional and international organizations aimed at achieving an end to witchcraft accusations and consequent human rights abuses, he clarifies that the victims of witch hunts are usually not pagans, witches, or practicing any spiritual practice typically considered pagan. Significantly, Resolution 47 emphasized that states should carefully distinguish between harmful practices amounting to human rights violations related to accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks and the lawful and legitimate exercise of different kinds of religion or beliefs in order to preserve the, the right to freely manifest a religion or a belief individually or in a community with others, including for persons belonging to religious minorities. In March 2023, the Pan-African Parliament released its own guidelines on accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks towards eliminating harmful practices and other human rights violations the 2023 document defines witchcraft in context, identifies two broad classifications of harmful practices related to the manifestation of belief in witchcraft, witchcraft accusations and ritual attacks, and other recommendations on both legal and non-legal measures the member states could adopt to combat ongoing human rights violations. The Pan-African Parliament also draws appropriate attention to the need to balance competing rights in order to avoid criminalizing freedom of thought, conscious religion, and culture. The guidelines highlight concerns for legal enforcement against human rights abuses and non-legal and community-based intervention. The Pan-African Parliament guidelines appear comprehensive in attempting to deal with the accusations of witchcraft and related harmful cultural practices on the African continent. The Pan-African Parliament concludes its report by encouraging the international community to continue to advocate for the victims and to advance the discourse on witchcraft, both generally and in relation to harmful religious and cultural practices. Thank you, Damon Leff, for your initiatives, and we will continue to amplify your efforts and message. By listening to what I am sharing here about South Africa, you are enlightening your mind on modern witchcraft nuances and currents in your world. Modern witch hunt advocates are very pleased with drafts of both the UNHRC resolution and the African Union guidelines. It will be up to all nations and states to implement the guidelines. Every state is in its own stage of confronting their witch hunt complexities and need our support. How can you be a part of these important additional efforts? Write our world leaders. Write your community leaders. Please see show notes for writing to the South African Minister of Justice and the South African Law Reform Commission to encourage robust action on their intentional guidelines. The Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project, an organized collaboration of diverse collaborators, has been working for an official state exoneration of the 17th century accused and hanged witches of the Connecticut colony. We support the Joint Committee on Judiciary Bills H.J. No. 34 resolution concerning certain witchcraft convictions in colonial Connecticut. We still need your additional efforts. Will you take time today to write a House representative and a senator asking them to recognize the relevance of exonerating Connecticut witch trial victims? You can do this whether you are a Connecticut resident or anywhere else in the world. You can do this as any political party member. This is a bipartisan effort. You should do it from right where you are. You can find the information you need to contact a legislator with a letter in the show links. Today, we got the update that the House has calendared the bill. We need the Senate to follow suit, and we need both floors to vote yes to Bill HJ number 34. Your message to them gets this done. You can follow our progress by joining our Discord community or Facebook groups. Links to all these informative opportunities are listed in the episode description. I would like information from on the ground in India. Advocates with information and education about which accusations in India, I want to hear from you. Please reach out through our websites or social media and tell me the nuances of what's happening and what can be done. Please support End Witch Hunts with your donations or purchases of educational witch trial books and merchandise. You can shop our merch at zazzle.com forward slash store forward slash End Witch Hunts or zazzle.com forward slash store forward slash thou shalt not suffer and shop our books at bookshop.org forward slash End Witch Hunts. We want you as a super listener. You can support Thou Shalt Not Suffer podcast production by super listening with your monthly monetary support. See episode description for links to these support opportunities. We thank you for standing with us and helping us to create a world that is safe from witchcraft accusations. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. What did we learn today, Josh? We learned about witchcraft belief in early New England, the founding of Connecticut, the founding of the town of Windsor, and of course about Alice Young. I noticed there was a lot of conflict. Yes tons of it. And one observation I've made is that it only takes a few minutes to tell the whole story of Alice Young's life. But we're going to spend more than a few minutes 
looking for more information on these victims. And thank you for listening to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. Join us next week. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Visit ThouShaltNotSuffer.com. Remember to tell your friends about the show. Please support our efforts to end witch hunts. Visit endwitchhunts.org to learn more. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.